and Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalom. This is a thing that we have to do together. The only way to get it together is together. You can't get anything together by yourself alone. And our process tonight is certainly going to be an interactive process, which means that I need to tap the group soul that is you and I together here, the Neshama Klalit. It is only from there that something of real significance can be drawn down. If I give you warmed up cholent, yesterday's thoughts thunk then, they might be good, but not really relevant because what is relevant is what Shechina, Divine Providence, is revealing at this moment. Ve'ata Yisrael, ma Hashem elokecha sho'el mi'imcha. Right now, it is that which God is requiring from us. So how are we going to do that? I can't do it by myself. I need you to help me out, at least with humming and then with singing. So we establish a field in which there can be that thing which is called a kol de be asara shrimta sharia, wherever there are ten together, the divine presence is with us. To invite the divine presence then. <laughs>
I'm here at this synagogue where my colleague Hugo Green ministers and several years ago there was a, a assistant associate rabbi here by the name of Levi Yitzchak Kelman and he had studied with me and I feel this is quite familiar territory and I want to say something of else about London. When I think of Manasseh in Israel, the one who spoke with Oliver Cromwell about the return of Jews to this country, and his great book, the Nishmat Chaim, it's a book in which he wrote about the afterlife, a territory that most Jews are not familiar with about what the Jewish teachings and the afterlife are. He writes there about reincarnation and speaks as a deep Kabbalist. He was the person whom Rembrandt painted in his famous picture of the rabbi, Manasseh ben Israel. There was another rabbi in London and I'm calling on their names because I would like to have the vibration of their being and of their thinking to connect with. And his name was Chacham David Nieto. David Nieto was a rabbi of the Sephardic congregation. And there were some people in this congregation who weren't quite happy with his ministry. And they thought one way to get rid of him is to have someone who had a reputation of being against all sorts of heresy. And they wrote and accused him of having said some terrible things that smacked of what Spinoza had said. Deus sive natura, God and nature are one. The person to whom they wrote was Chacham Tzvi. He was the rabbi then of Hamburg. And in the letter in which they accused Chacham Nieto of all kinds of things, they said, and the worst thing is that he said that God and nature are one. Chacham Tzvi was a wise man. He was in touch also with the intention behind what Chacham Nieto said. And he wrote back the following. If you, can you hear me in the back without the mic for a moment? Okay, I'll come back over here a little later. He said, if you take the word hateva, hateva, and you add it up, what do you get? Do you know how numerology works with Hebrew letters? Let's begin. Ayin is 70. Bet is 2. Tet is 9. And He is 5. Give me the total. If you take the name Elohim, the divine name, Aleph is 1. Lamed is 30. 
hey is 5, yud is 10, and mem is 40, gives you the same number. So he said, Elohim begematria hateva. Do not accuse him for the word for God and the word for nature have the same numerical value. For a Kabbalist, that is a pretty good argument. I want to bring these two people into my presentation here because I feel that both of them bring dimensions to our thinking as Jews that are really important ones. I grew up in Vienna in Austria, as you have heard before. I was born in Poland. We were a Hasidic family, and I attended both a yeshiva in the afternoon and a gymnasium, a high school, a Hebrew high school, the highest gymnasium, in the morning. That's a stretch. Shabbos afternoon, I would go to Brit Bilu, which was a sort of a Shomer Hatzair affiliate, and later on in the afternoon to Agudat Israel for Sudash Lishit, for valedictory to the Sabbath. And I want to invite you, too, to stretch this kind of creative tension that would say, yes, I want this, and I want this, and I will not let go. Later on in my life, that showed itself in other ways that I went and received my ordination from Lubavitch Yeshiva and my doctorate from Hebrew Union College. Hebrew Union College is the Reform Seminary in the United States. Do you get the stretch that's involved? I tell you this in order to prepare the field for that stretch. Most people don't like to stand as much tension. They say, make up your mind. Are you with these or are you with those? You can't be both at the same time. And yet, all of us have experienced that when we held on to tensions that tugged at us from both sides, a creative integration takes place that looks for something in a third possibility. How do we say this in Hebrew? There are two sentences in the Bible. One is on this side, one is on that side. They seem to contradict one another. If you have hold on long enough, then comes a third sentence, and you can somehow find a way of balancing the two. I'd like to share with you some of the thinking that went into the balance. This will take quite a bit of the first period that we will be together. We will then have a break, and I will then want to deal more with issues that derive out of Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. So I give you notice of my intent. I also hope to take questions from the floor, and I hope that I can address them, and I hope that they would be searching questions on your part, and I will do the best I can to be open to answers that come in the here and now to me. So let me then begin. What is it like to grow up as a child in a household in which orthodoxy is practiced, and yet at the same time to be in Vienna, where at the, the zeitgeist of that time is Freud, and up to the early 30s Marx, and Zionism, Herzl. And how do you balance that? The deep feeling I had was, I had seen what it was like to go and visit different Hasidic masters, to be at their table, to have that sense of mystery that surrounds a tish when late Sabbath afternoon, Hasidim would sit singing and sometimes in a kind of quiet, a silence, waiting for the master to speak. And the children of the Rishner group of Hasidim were not much used to giving a lot of Torah. Silence around their table was more often what happened. Can you then imagine 
sitting in such a silence, and people then rise from the table and begin to shout out, Hashem Melech, Hashem Malach, Hashem Yimloch Leolam Ba'ed, the Lord was king, the Lord is king, the Lord shall be king forever and ever. You hear that extension coming out with ecstatic calling out. It made a great impression, a deep impression on me. It meant for me that the truth that is revealed at Sinai, the truth that comes down to us through the ages, the truth that God is the protector and guardian, that his side of the covenant is, notice, definitely masculine at that time, that his side of the covenant will be kept by him and that we are to keep our side of the covenant. But that was a reality, a truth for me. 1938 comes, there's the Anschluss, Hitler comes, and that there is a break that begins to happen. It doesn't look like we are safe anymore. We flee to Belgium, and there in Belgium, it was after Kristallnacht. During Kristallnacht I was in the hospital after having an appendicitis attack and an appendectomy, and seeing the victims brought into the hospital to our ward. And later on, a Gestapo person coming in, ripping off bandages and killing them. This made an impression on me. Where is this God who promised? Where will the next integration be? We fled to Belgium, and for a while it looked to me that physical survival was all that was important to me until I met a group of people, and they were Chabad Hasidim. I do want to tell you this in greater, at greater length because it's a beautiful story and an insight into a process. It's Shabbos afternoon, it's in, in the spring, late spring. I know that this is a time when people sit down and study Pirkei Avot after Passover before Shavuot, the ethics of the fathers. The lesson always begins with the sentence, all of Israel have a part in the world to come. Ah, pie in the sky and the sweet by and by. I was so sure here I would get myself a good fight. So I come to, to Pirche Agudat Israel, walk into the place, and sure enough, people are sitting down to study Pirche Avot, and as soon as the leader begins to say, all of Israel has a part in the world to come, I say, pie in the sky, it's not true, opiate of the masses, and so on and so forth, and I pour out the whole stuff, standing near the door for a quick getaway. <laughs> How wonderful was the surprise when all the other young people who were there were ready to pounce on me, but he held them back, the leader who led this class, and said, would you like to hear from someone who has similar things to say that you have to say? <laughs> now here I was surprised. He reached for the Talmud Sanhedrin and found in the back of that section of Sanhedrin Maimonides' commentary on that chapter that begins with all Israel has a part in the world to come and begins to read to me from this chapter and he says, very few people really have a notion of what this afterlife is about. Some people think, and then he takes all those things that I had just sort of debunked and says, some people think that the afterlife is a place where like Schlaraffenland. Do you know that word? Yes. Uh, big rock candy mountain. You eat yourself through a, through a mountain of pudding, and on the other side there is this waiting for you, and there, there are rivers going with, with wine, and trees that are growing with garments, and that this is the, the kind of thing that's going to happen to you in the afterlife. And Maimonides puts down one after another of these notions very much like the one that I felt was most unfair, how we will all be alike and we'll be on top and they'll be on the bottom when the Messiah comes. Finally, he opens up his argument and says, what spirituality is all about, very few people know. Just as a blind man does not know what color is and as a eunuch does not know what sex is and as a deaf person does not know what music is, so does the average person not know what spirituality is. How could we talk about an afterlife which is spiritual? 
Can you imagine what this did to me? Hearing for the first time a voice that spoke both from tradition and not in a vulgar way, that raised a ceiling for me that had been much too low and that allowed me to begin to think and to pray and to become involved with a group of people. They were all Chabadnikis. They were studying Tanya. For my birthday, they gave me a Tanya, but they didn't, didn't let me study it yet. They steered me first to another book by Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, which is known as Mesilat Yesharim, The Path of the Upright. Let me tell you a bit about that. This book, he says, I did not write to teach you something you do not know. I'm writing this book to remind you of things that everyone knows, but because they are so well known, nobody pays much attention to these things. And that is that the purpose of a human being is to provide God with shleimu ta'avodah, with a perfection of divine service. That all study and all prayer and all learning, all of which has only one aim, and that is that our service to the highest be in a perfection, be in a, in a completeness. Now, if you know what your path was during your adolescence, when you hear somebody giving you a goal with purity and with, with understanding and raised beyond that level that you need to debunk and showing you a rationale, a purity of thought and of belief, and then taking you through the 13 principles of the Jewish faith step by step, as Maimonides does there, it, it was overwhelming to me. I want you to hear that because this was my entrance into the way. It was for the first time that I felt a commitment to that path. It wasn't merely that I would say, this is the God of my fathers. I could say, this is my God. Ze eli ve'anvehu. And I still recall to this day the day when things were so clear to me that I saw this crack, as it were, in the cosmic egg where it became absolutely clear to me why God hides and how God hides so that the freedom of choice be given to us. And when I saw this before my mind's eye, I was moved to pray, Rabbi Shalom, do not take this away from me. Al tashlicheni milpanecha veruach kotshecha al tikach Cast me not away from you. Do not take away that spirit of holiness. Because when you have a glimpse, a moment of that vision, you feel then that you are a child of the universe. You have a right to be here. That there is a plan, an intent in creation. And how this warms heart and soul. And what it does is it starts the growth. If I were to call this by a name, I would say, this is the vernalization of the seed, of the divine seed in the soul. You know what I mean, vernalizing? When a seed goes through the winter, it gets kicked into growth when spring comes. It was, for me, this kind of kicking into growth. The plains with the bombs came over Antwerp. We had to flee again. We fled into France. There we were in turn in a concentration camp in the Vichy side of France. Then we come, we come to Marseille. After a while being in Marseille, I meet a Rabbi Zalman Schneerson, who before had a yeshiva in, and a synagogue in Paris. And meeting him one Shabbos afternoon, hearing him teach, he sat there and taught a wonderful teaching that spoke of two kinds of Torah, a Torah that we acquire by our learning and a Torah that God infuses into our soul. 
Yair of Kamotar Likhi Tizel Katalim Rossi. This is how he began. Let my word, my my teaching drip like rain to you, and let my word come to you like the dew. And he said there are two kinds of teaching. There's a teaching that comes like rain, which is the cloud goes up and the rain comes down, and it is teaching that you acquire by effort, and then the learning comes. And then there is another teaching that seeps into the soul like the dew. And la bischuta talia has nothing to do with whether you earn this. This is grace teaching, teaching that comes not because of your merit, but teaching that comes because God so loves you that God wants to reveal. Okay. Hearing that, you can imagine what this did to me again. Ah, Amichai, here is my connection again to those people who had taught me in Antwerp. And I begged him then, is it possible for you to make a yeshiva for us, who were at that point in, in Galut, in Marseille? And he set up a yeshiva, and somebody began to teach us. And so we were studying for a while. And then he, Tu Bishvat, came and he said, I will send you a guest. I'm not just telling you, Mises, if you follow me, you will soon see that there is a thread that goes through and that has something to do with the concepts that I hope to develop a little bit further. So he says, I can't be with you for two Bishvat, for the New Year of the Trees, but I will send you a guest. This guest comes in. He was dressed different than anyone that I had seen at that time. In those days, there were hardly any beards around. If you saw a beard, beard usually went with a capote, with a black outfit. To see someone in a regular business suit with a beard and with a fedora hat that, that turned down, that didn't look like the usual situation. So this man comes in, <coughs> sits at the head of the table, uh, says l'chaim to us and says, Vos lerntir, what is it that you're studying? I was surprised I'd heard him speak only French and Hebrew before. <coughs> He's speaking Yiddish, and we tell him that we are studying the tractate of Ketubot, and he begins like this. Quoting the first Mishnah in Ketubot, it says, a virgin is wedded on the fourth day. Israel is the virgin wedded <laughs> to God in relation to God. The rabbis taught us 2,000 years are wild and woolly. 2,000 years are Torah. 2,000 years is a time for the Messiah. So, if we would have merited, the Messiah would have come at the end of the fourth millennium, and we would have then been redeemed. He continued to ask the question, why not the first millennium? Why do you have to wait for the fourth millennium? And he says, one gives the bride three days to prepare herself, to beautify herself. And then he began to give us a teaching of the holy sparks that had fallen, that had to be raised up to be returned back to the crown of God. OK, I lost you. Some of you I lost. Let's go back a little bit, OK? The teaching is, why, did, why does the world not begin with the Messianic era? The world cannot begin with the Messianic era because the process in which we have to accumulate the merit gained by our own work, raising up the fallen sparks of divinity in the world, that has to be the way in which the bride adorns herself during these first three days to be worthy of that consummation that is to come at the end. Okay. And then he said, but what about if she is not a virgin, if she is a widow? That is to say, if we had committed sins but not intentionally, then the wedding would have been on the fifth day. The Messiah would have come in the fifth millennium. I go and make it a little shorter because the point I want to make is then he said, and what about if she has been a divorcee? Then her wedding is in the, on the sixth day, on Friday, so that it could have the blessing of God blessing human beings. Now, what he then began to cough 
which was the way in which he covered tears. And he said, whoa, it is already so late Friday afternoon and the wedding has not yet taken place. 5,700 is already late Friday afternoon and the wedding has not yet taken place. Who was that masked man, I asked after he left. <laughs> they told me he was Rabbi Schneerson who lived in Nice. Turned out to be the present Lubavitch Rebbe who had been studying at the Sorbonne. And there he laid out for me, in this marvelous way, a kind of series of history, an understanding of history, in which I could then see that the vicissitudes that happen to us in history are part of a growth plan. I want to leave this hang. There's one string of the macrame, and leave this be for a bit. I will come back to it a little later. I'm going to skip a lot of time now. I went to Lubavitch Yeshiva when I came to New York. I studied there, graduated, went and founded a yeshiva in New Haven, Connecticut, had experience as a congregational rabbi, and there began to meet. If you're a rabbi out of town, you begin to meet ministers because you're part of a ministerial organization. And then to begin to see that what I before hadn't wanted to see, that there was a certain amount of, I couldn't believe it, divine presence there and other people outside of Jewry. Now, how do you accommodate that in your mind? It was a little harder. Remember this wonderful saying that said that God went around with the Torah from nation to nation and said, can you accept the Torah? Well, what was it like when God went around from, with the Torah from nation to nation? See it as process. Don't see it as a man knocking on the door and, you know, like, like a, a customer peddler and saying, do you want to buy a little bit of Torah? Okay. How do you see this as a process? And I began to realize how that Torah of the do had been given all around the world. I began to read some things in comparative religion and then sought to do my work at Boston University in the School of Theology to learn pastoral psychology in order to be a better rabbi for the congregation, a better pastor. What I met then was a wonderful, amazing person. Howard Thurman, he was the dean of the chapel of Boston University, and he taught a course, Spiritual Disciplines and Resources, with labs, laboratory sessions. In other words, not only words, but experiences. And this is why I began with the song, because it is important to recognize that we are indeed, as the Kabbalah sees us, fourfold beings. All of reality is this fourfold reality. Let me show you what I mean. I'm writing the following in mirror writing, okay? Could you imagine this the other way around? As a yud on top, as a he below, as a vav below that, and as a he below that. I didn't do this with the precision of the Hebrew the other way around, otherwise we couldn't erase the blackboard. Okay. Now, what is it that I want to indicate here? We are made in the image, in the silhouette of yud he vav he the tetragrammaton, God. Our head is the Yud. Our arms and shoulders are the He. The spine is the Vav. The pelvis and legs make the other He. Get that sense of we are in the image. That means also 
that when we speak of God's name, we need to say that each letter of God's name is a dimension of a divine reality. We begin with the reality of the world of Asiya, this physical world. For too long, during the 19th century especially, we have become prisoners of only that level of reality. What I can't see with my eyes and what I cannot measure does not exist, was the notion of that empiricism that meant that the realities that belonged to the world of affect were put aside, the imaginal realities, the astral <coughs> realities. And the realities that belonged to the upper hay that had to do with the intellectual, the world of thought, the ideal world of Plato, that we did not consider that either as a reality. And worse yet, that we had not noticed the power of intuition, which is the yud, that point of being. To be able to learn, to see the experiential world of the believing person as being all these transpersonal realities, not only on the physical realm, not only in the body, but transcending the body and being that which is of the heart, and that which is of the mind, and that which is of the intuition, and to see them simultaneously, that that vision was the kind of vision that had been given to me before in the yeshiva and was part of the Hidbonenut, the Aliyat HaNeshama, how we want to raise our soul from level to level to level to level <coughs> until we can then come to that point of the Yud on top, which is a place of the identity of the human soul with the essence of God, that which is called Yechida Shebenefesh, that oneing. Those of you who know this wonderful book, The Cloud of Unknowing, there, that word oneing is used. In Hebrew, we would say yichud, that unification, that oneing in which we are. So I had this opportunity of being able to meet this person, but when I first met him, I didn't know that I could trust him. And he had challenged me with the words, don't you trust the Ruach HaKodesh? He used the Hebrew for that. Don't you trust the spirit of holiness. Okay, here this black man, a Baptist minister, <laughs> dean of the chapel, Boston University. Uh, I want to know, should I join his class with the labs that he is giving? And he is asking me, don't you trust the Ruach HaKodesh? Well, it's an answer you cannot say no to. Do you realize that? <laughs> Either if you admit there is Ruach HaKodesh, you cannot say, I do not trust the Ruach HaKodesh. And so the first lab, I sat in class, and he read to us Psalm 139, and he had us meditate on that psalm. Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, even there thou art. You know my getting up and my lying down. If there is ever a thought in my heart, you know it first. So he had read the psalm, and then we sat in silence and meditated on it. And then he played some records. Bruce Kolnidri came on. It was as if he were to say to me, relax, buddy, relax. It's OK. And I began to see that the deficit that most of us had in our religious education was that we were told to have something and not given the tools how to. Someone would say, you've got to have faith. Can't go to the grocery store to buy faith. How does one acquire faith? How does one nurture faith? Ure'e emuna, pasture your faith. How, how does one do that? And I discovered that we had a vast literature 
of spiritual direction, the recipes of the spiritual know-how, cookbooks of the spirit, as it were. If you wish to prepare for the Sabbath so that you can really open yourself to the Sabbath, these are the things that you do. If you wish to purify yourself, these are the intentions with which you dip in the baptismal pool in the mikveh. If you wish to wrap yourself in the talit so that you feel closer to the presence of God, this is the order in which you do it. And I began this study with great joy, abstracting from there some things that I could teach other people to do. And so we began to have a series of retreats and a little booklet was written then called The First Step, which is found in the back of the first Jewish catalog as a guide for Jewish meditation. Meditation didn't begin with Maharishi. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, a long, long time before all that, we spoke of Hegyon Libi Lefanecha, the meditation of my heart before thee. And we had teachers who taught us about Hitbonenut, about how to look into the self, how to visualize, how to see, and how to meditate. Now I tell you all these things as part of the background. And now remember the dangling string. One of my colleagues was a man by the name of Richard Rubinstein, who had then written a book called After Auschwitz, in which he spoke about the impossibility of continuing Jewish theology as business as usual after Auschwitz. And there was a truth, a terrible, terrifying truth in that. And after Auschwitz, there was also Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And nobody could do business as usual after the atom was split and the bomb was made. And there was a moonwalk. And we saw a picture of what Earth looks like from the moon. And we don't see the boundaries. And a whole new cosmology is dawning in us. And now I'd like to take you back for a little bit. When was the last time there was a dawning of a new cosmology? I'm going to use some shorthand here. And the shorthand that I'm going to use will be familiar to some people from astrology. But I don't necessarily mean astrology. I just mean that shorthand. When people speak of eons and ages, they say the following thing. This is the dawning of the age of? Aquarius. Aquarius. Okay. Prior to that age of Aquarius was the age of Pisces. Before that was the age of Aries. Before that was the age of Taurus. Now those of you who have seen an old Mahazor, the prayer book for the pilgrimage holidays, do you recall seeing the prayer for Geshem or the prayer for Tal? In those prayers for Geshem and Tal, you have all the signs of the zodiac in there, these old woodcuts. In other words, we were already concerned with reality maps that included in themselves the signs of the zodiac. If you have heard of the book of Yetzirah, there every month is seen as a month dealing with that zodiac, with that part of the body that corresponds to it, with the letters of the Hebrew alphabet that have connection with that month, so, and that sign of the zodiac, and the tribe of the 12 tribes, which is connected with that. I began to see that our teachings from the past had some very powerful things to tell. So, if we look back at the Judaism that we find in the Bible, what does it look like? Well, what's our technology? Sacred technology tells a great deal about the other technology. The talit is made of wool from sheep. The tzitzit are made of wool from sheep. The Torah is written on skin from sheep. We call us together with the ram's horn. The sinews 
the guts of the sheep are used to sew the skins of the sheep together to make the Torah. And the tefillin are made from the rawhide of the sheep. What does it say? A shepherd culture uses what's available for at its hand to be able to create the sancta, the holy things with which God is served. Okay? Now, what is the image that comes to us about God during those days of the patriarchal Judaism? Let's go <clears throat> a step back, prior to patriarchal Judaism. What is the image that you find? If you look at archaeology and you see how did people depict their gods, the earlier, the farther you go back, the more the gods looked zoomorphic. Do you hear that? They looked like animals, like the bull, Anubis, the dog, segment the lioness. Do you see that? Notions that people had of the minotaur, again the bull, and what was it that we fell back when we no longer had our connection with the living God? And earlier, along with that, also the bull, the young calf. Okay? And so the golden calf was the image of going back to an earlier period. Okay? Then, we describe God very much in anthropomorphic terms. And in theology you would call that, in philosophy you would call that the God of deism. It is a, a, an image of God coming in and departing. If you look at the Hebrew words, God said, let me go down and see what's doing on there in Sodom and Gomorrah. Is it like the outcry that reaches me to heaven? See that? The sense was that God is descending from on high, coming down. So the language in the Bible, the, the, the very language that caused Maimonides so much struggle in his guide for the perplexed, was dealing with this anthropomorphic, larger God. And what does this God want from us twice a day? Et korbani lachmi leishai reach nechochi tishmehu lahakrit li bemoado. Twice a day you are to feed me. A sheep in the morning, a sheep at night. Okay? That was the image of the sacrificial cult that came along. Words were hardly used in the service of God in that period. The only words that the Bible prescribes are those with the giving and the bringing of the first fruits. No other words. All this, the, the service was done by priests at that time. Why am I telling you about all that? Because when the temple service no longer was possible at the destruction of the second temple, we moved into a period where we had to replace sacrifice with lip service. The temple was destroyed not so much Sacrifices ceased, not so much because the temple was destroyed, but the temple was destroyed because the technology of sacrifices was finished. A new technology arose, it was the technology of the word. And we entered into the age of Pisces, at that point, learning how to use the word. The rabbis gave us formula, and they said, this is the coin of the realm. If you wish to thank God for food, this is what you say. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech olam ha'motzi lechem in ha'aretz. This is the way in which you do that. A shift had taken place. I need to go back about four or five hundred years earlier. The first temple is destroyed. It's about the time when we have the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. If you go to Greece, whom would you find there at that time? Plato and Aristotle, Socrates. If you went to ancient Iran, whom would you find there at that time? Zarathustra. If you came to India, you would find Mahavira and the Buddha there at that time. And if you came to China, you would find Lao Tzu and Kung Fu Tzu, Confucius and Lao Tzu. 
Isn't that amazing that about that all these people were contemporaries? It is as if a blip on the radar of the global brain, boom, there is a, a, a lightning flash. And this lightning flash creates across the board insight that is fantastic insight about the same time as there is destruction of the temple. Do you see catastrophe connected at the same time with insight, with something new coming down? The image that we used later on was to speak of birth pangs. <coughs> it was not a death knell so much as it was a birthing of something that was taking place. And now. A whole new Judaism had to come into being when the temple was destroyed. The sacred technology that we used up to that time was no longer accessible to us. We had to make portable. Before God was found for us in space, where did we find God afterwards? In time. The sanctuary that was in space became the sanctuary in time. Professor Heschel beautifully described it in his great book, The Sabbath, where he said, the Sabbath is the palace in time. We entered into time. We found God in time. If you follow me for a little bit longer in this, in this train of thought, I can take you to an interpretation of a sentence that goes like this. You have seen over many a synagogue or a temple written the words, Seek ye the Lord where he may be found. Dir shu Adonai behim Seek ye the Lord where he may be found. Originally this meant in Jerusalem. This is the place where God has chosen to make his name dwell therein. And then there was another interpretation. The rabbis then said, ah, I'm glad the flash didn't go off. <laughs> Give me a warning. Okay. And the next one that the rabbis say goes like this. Seek ye the Lord where he may be found. These are the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Did you hear that? No longer do they say find God in space. Now they say find God in time. And so I go back to the book of Yetzirah, which says that all of reality is to be understood. That's the last one because it gives me a, a shock in my eyes and I can't do very well uh, uh, speaking. I, I get distracted. Well, then I tell you what, I'll stop talking for a bit and do it. Okay? <laughs> I'll make with the hands as if I'm <laughs> But I get distracted. <laughs> Thank you. I know <laughs> you have to do your thing and I have to do mine. But I can't do mine while you do yours, so I'd rather wait a little bit. Okay, that's fine. I can look at you straight now. How is this? Better. Three more, and that's it. Three more. Wonderful. Wonderful. I eat off machna lib. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Okay. So, the, the after image is giving me some problems. That's, that, that's, what, that's what I'm complaining about, okay? So, the book of Yetzirah says, reality is to be seen as olam, shana, nefesh, okay? First space, then time, and now person. There are three dimensions in which we measure something. The first dimension is where is it in space? Then when is it? During what time will I find it there? Before I won't find it, after I won't find it. When will it be there? So it is time, it, it's space, and it is time. And then what is it? Who is it who is there? And that's Nefesh. And so God was manifesting to us at one time in Olam, in space, and then in time. And now we are at the beginning of a new paradigm, and this is what I want to talk about really a lot more. So I brought you to this place where we can start looking at reality maps. The God of the medieval period, of after the second temple period, was not the God of, 
I'm not saying not the God. It was not the God idea. The God idea that existed after the destruction of the temple was not the God idea that existed before. So when Onkelos had to translate and say, and God descended, he didn't want to use those words because it wasn't fitting that God would move in space because God filled the all. Omnipresent doesn't move. So what does it mean God descended? So therefore, Onkelos translates Ve'itkali, God manifested. See, because by that time the deistic notion was out and the theistic notion had come in. And the theistic notion speaks of God as anima mundi, the soul of the world. As the soul fills the body, so does the Holy One, blessed be He, fill the universe. And we now got a whole different notion. And our theology that was built afterwards was built on that notion. A paradigm shift had taken place. After the paradigm shift, a whole new ball game <coughs> was there. It was necessary to rediscover the Judaism that applied for that then new age. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was for that time the new age rabbi. Can you follow me in this? Rabbi Akiva in his school, they were the New Age people. They had to furnish, as it were, give us the tools wherewith we could be Jews in the next whole period that was now opening up for us because the old means that we had no longer served us. They were no longer available. So I had taken us before to Auschwitz, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, the moonwalk, fifth generation computer, Chaos, the understandings of the mathematics of chaos, string theory, all the old pictures that we had of what reality is like have fallen away. A new cosmology is emerging. In this new emerging cosmology, we have learned, for instance, some terrible truths. We used to believe that we could throw things away. There is no way where you can throw anything. <laughs> we used to believe, we used to look at kashrut in a particular way. And now we are being asked to look at what's eco-kosher, ecologically kosher. Eco-kosher has some other re new requirements. The old requirement was and a one-way bottle is much better than a two-way bottle. It hasn't been used before. It's definitely going to be kosher, right? <laughs> but a one-way bottle is worse than a two-way bottle. That's not recycled. And so we have to start thinking about things in a whole new way. And this is where we have a conflict. The conflict goes as follows. Give me that old-time religion. It was good enough for my father, it's good enough for me. I would like to be able to hang on to the way in which things were in the past. Why? The answer is simple. It worked then, and it's hopefully it's going to work for me now. There is an element that says, I would like to be able to replicate that which worked in the past, and I'd like to be able to continue it. And what do you do? when a new cosmology is emerging, a new understanding of reality is emerging, a new understanding of who is a human being and what is a human being is emerging, a new understanding of what it means to be a, the human population on the globe, a new understanding of the relatedness of species outside of the human species, that we are all dolphins and human beings, sharing an environment, that Mother Earth is alive, perhaps sick and ailing, but she is alive, and that we now have to deal with Gaia, with that understanding of who is Earth and who are we in the ecology, in the totality of that community, which is the community of life on this planet. And whenever we turn, to the old sources and the old reality maps, we cannot create the tools for our survival 
because we have come past a paradigm shift point where we have to, as Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai, in his day and age, we need to create the new tools coming out of the emerging cosmology. That's the burden of what I want to tell you about. And so now, I think it's about time to get close to the break that we are to have. And I'd like to ask you to, I must have raised some notions, some ideas, some questions in your mind. And I'd like to mark them down on the blackboard here so that I might address some of these after the break. Would you then please stand up and call out loud so that I can hear what it is you're saying, please. Mashiach and existentialism. Wait one moment till it's in written. The, the in relation to modern Jewish concepts. Okay, thank you. God and nature is all one. Uh, do you believe in, in the prayer between an individual and the personal of God? If God and nature is all one, do you believe in the prayer between an, an individual and a personal God? Thank you. Yes, I'm very glad that you mentioned the ecological question. And since one is trying to tune into the spiritual, um, it seems to me that there is a very big lack of tuning into the physical. Because if we don't do that, we're not going to have a cosmos to uh, tune into the spiritual. What is, do you have a question? What, yes, yes. Um, uh, could I ask what can one do about this? How does one approach dealing with the spiritual while not neglecting or forgetting the physical, the integration of the two? Thank you. Please. Matt? Uh, your views on um, communication with spirits and mediums. Views on communication with spirits and mediums. Views on <coughs> the goddess as well as God terms for the New Age. Your views on astrology as an ecumenical concept of, of the determinism of God um, in a deep and wise way. Thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. Views on astrology and abbreviated. You mentioned that uh, we need to find new tools, and I'm wondering what your criteria are for a new Judaism. Is that what you suggested? Criteria for a new Judaism. Can people hear well without the microphone, the questions? <laughs> then we'll, we'll continue. I just would like to. Just hold for a bit. <laughs> Just hold for a bit. I would like to correct that last yes, statement. Yes. The issue is organic connection, not new invention, OK? And I'll, we'll talk more about it. But I wanted to, to, to say this, correct this right now. I'm not coming with a brand new edition. I'm saying it's, it has to be something like if you had a computer that was on CPN, and now you're doing it on MS-DOS. Okay, <laughs> to be able to emulate and to bring the, 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 the files you had from the past, but so make them accessible under the new environment. I just wanted to say this at this point so we don't, we don't misunderstand the, the bridge that I need to make. Okay, thank you. Ma'am, please. I was reassured by what you were saying about new technology after the temporary 
Fitzroy, and it disturbs me still, and the thing that's put me on Julius over the years is the, the continual repetition in the prayer book about slaughtering and bringing back the temple as a slaughterhouse, virtually. And also, the disturbs me when I see the little literature that they swing a chicken down his head and the father slaughtering it. I think this is a very bad press for the Jews. It's the same as the that most of the land are sacrificing. Thank you, ma'am. Is it possible that the spiritual dimension has not entered because the Jew still keeps his hat on his head center? Uh -huh. <laughs> than one? Please, yes. yeah. Please. It is well known that the Vilna law rejected Hasidism, which has always been regarded as an instrument of escape from reality. <coughs> Consequently, my question, can Hasidism claim to have made a contribution to Judaism in general? I think everybody heard those, yes? yes. So wait one moment until it's written. <laughs> Surely the paradigm of the change in energy will come from within and not from without. Is that a question? <laughs> it's a for a I got it. Okay. I got it. Thank you. Well, let me finish up. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm running out of space, but we'll go to the Are you all prepared to camp out here for a week? <laughs> Be able to give us some brief methodology for adapting to the new concepts, the new age, without jettisoning the old and sort of throwing the good away with the bad. A brief methodology for adapting to the new without jettisoning the old. Wonderful. I think this is a paper question. Okay. Thank you. It couldn't be set up any better. Sir. Um, it's come down to us in, in the stories that the Balsham Club, for example, didn't just sit and study with words and letters in books and all that. He used to go out into the forest and do whatever he did in there. Now that seems to me to, to uh, be virgin on shamanism, effectively. I, that's what I think it is. So what I'm asking is, have you got any teachings that link shamanism to Judaism or a Jewish approach into that world? Is there a link between shamanism and Judaism or the two approaches? And that's just the fact. I still haven't understood the, uh, the tragedy of the, uh, many things like the Holocaust. Are you saying that the destruction preempts creation? And why, do, why, why need such destruction to bring out such beauty? Okay. I, uh, I, it's like, I, I can't. Tell you what, I don't have an answer for that. Fair enough. I don't. This is an observation. This is what's happening. I can't say that I would have planned it that way. Man, you had a. More precision about the word spirituality. Good question. <coughs> How do you see the 
future of Israel and in particular the state of Israel. The future of Israel and in particular the state of Israel. intrepid and brave souls here. The attrition rate is almost zero. What's the age of Aquarius? Well, every eon, every period in history has a mindset. Just the same way as there is an ecology of space, there is an ecology of time. When people talked about this, they called it zeitgeist, the spirit of an age. And there is an understanding in Jewish mysticism which is based on a teaching by Rabbi Nachman of Braslav in which he puts it this way. In the service of Neila, Yom Kippur, at the end of Yom Kippur, it says, Av Yadoacha Minoar. Av, 
Abraham our father, Yedoach HaInuyu, me Noar from youth. Based on the Midrash, Ben Shalosh Shanim Hikir Abraham et Boho. Abraham was three years old when he recognized his creator. Rab Nachman, in a powerful tour de force, reads it, Av Yedoach HaMinoar, Abraham knew you when you still were a young God. Do you hear that move? Abraham knew you from your youth, not from his youth, but from your youth, God. There is an understanding that the same way as we speak of growth in human terms, that there is a kind of growth not in the transcendent God, but in God immanent. There is God, as we understand God, as so they've called Almin, surrounding the universe, transcending the universe. And there is an understanding that is memaliko almin, filling the world. And you fill according to capacity. And as our capacity was smaller, the images that we had, the interfaces, the root metaphors that we utilized in our relation to God, the God names that we used, were less mature than the subsequent God names when a larger container was made, as it were, to contain more of that memalikal ami, the immanence of God. During the time of earlier ages, there was not yet the human capacity, except for some few geniuses, and I'm going to those geniuses in the axial age, that's to say, when I was mentioning before Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and the Greek philosophers, and all the way across to Lao Tzu, Confucius, there were a few geniuses, but the rest of the people in the world hadn't yet caught up to being able to see so vast a view. So when I'm saying that there is a new cosmology emerging, this is what I mean by the age of Aquarius at this point. The emerging understanding of Earth as being alive, as being conscious, the way in which Teilhard de Chardin is speaking of our going through a period that's called <clears throat> no genesis, a new creation of consciousness, and from there we are moving to the demonization of the planet. That is to say, we are becoming better and greater vessels for being able to see more and more of God. Therefore, the divine does not have to appear to us in anthropomorphic terms, but we begin to see it as vaster and much greater than before. That's one of the elements of the age of Aquarius. That's the best I can do with a short definition of that. If you would like to read some more on that, I suggest you look at the name Ken Wilbur and Marilyn Ferguson, who speaks about the Aquarian conspiracy. And you can read more up on that, and that deals with the emerging cosmology. And there is so much good stuff, exciting stuff being written that hasn't yet, we haven't yet caught up in seminaries. And when we haven't caught up in seminaries, then we haven't caught up in the pew. Do you realize there's a time lag? Last year, I had the privilege of teaching a course for the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College and they have years divided in the biblical period, rabbinic period, <clears throat> medieval period, modern period, and contemporary. Contemporary stops with the Second World War. They have not yet included in their curriculum the currently emerging paradigm. And so I had a chance during that year to read with those students what is now being written. And this material now requires that we do our reinterpretation of our understanding of Judaism in light of the state of the art of understanding the universe. And this is what I mean at this point, the emerging cosmology, that's what I want to call the age of Aquarius. For other people, they might mean a lot more yet, but I'll leave it at this point. Would you say a word about 
the great expansion of capacity to comprehend the paradoxes of God after the great anger of Edgar after the shock. Oh, oh. Okay. <clears throat> Some years ago, we had a meeting in Berkeley called Torah and Dharma. Torah and Dharma. Do you know the word Dharma? Dharma stands for the law as seen by the Far Eastern religions emerging out of Hinduism and Buddhism. So the Dharma is a way of saying the way of righteousness, according to the Eastern way. So we had this conference called Torah and Dharma. We were graced at that time by someone standing out there with a billboard, Torah versus Dharma. <laughs> <laughs> Not Torah and Dharma, but we were dealing with Torah and Dharma. My friend Rip Shlomo could not attend. He was busy elsewhere. So I had asked him, do me a favor, Shlomo Liv. I'd like to have you be also present, and at least on a tape. Would you make me a tape? And so he did the following on the tape. He said, everybody knows, you know, my French limit talks, everybody knows. The Heidegger Ishpitzer said, why is it that a priest is not permitted to be present where corpses, a koyan, is not supposed to be in the same place where there is a dead body? So the Ishbitzer says, because anybody who sees a corpse gets so angry at God. Why did God have to make it in such a way that you can't exit this world except via dying? that this anger at God is so great, so powerful. Now, what is a koyin supposed to do? It is written, Kisifte koyin yishmarudat v'toro yivakshami piyu. The, the, the lips of a koyin are to guard the knowledge, and Torah is to come from his mouth. But what do you do if the koyin is angry? Then he cannot teach. If he becomes a tame mate, if he becomes impure due to his anger, to his great anger, why did God have to make it this way? Then there isn't any good teaching that can come from him. And then Shlomo said the following. After the Holocaust, we are all tame and mating. We all have become impure by that death around us. And we haven't yet gotten to the place where we have forgiven God. So young people who were hungry for a word about the living God could not come to our teachers because they were so seething with rage that they had to go to other people who were at this point not angry with God to receive a word of the living God. I thought that that was such a powerful teaching. It's over 40 years since the Holocaust. We have not yet had the meeting of our Torah great or of our theologians to really work this one through. We go around, we are sitting on a volcano of repressed anger against God. And so the theology that we can come up with is almost a reaction formation. It is almost as if to say, God, we're going to show you. We will hold on to our end of the bargain and show you because we have a certain vindictiveness to still to prove. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. It'll take a while until we will be able to digest that and to deal with it in the right way. The challenge is so fantastic now. While we're on the subject, I want to say I run into a number of people from time to time who are recycled souls. <laughs> who have made their exit last time around in the gas chambers. There are times when these people come close to depth experiences and with it to the horror of what they, what they are feeling. And the healing that we need to work on. I want to say this. Uh, 
especially for you, Lindsay. I saw the headlines about the convent in Auschwitz, and I want to go on record here. Our problem is not that the Carmelites have a convent. Our problem is that we don't have, like a Beit Hamidrash and a yeshiva there, for people to sit and to work through the Greek work and the theological work that has to be done. It is, it is a pain for us to be able to, to go and say to people who are saying, we want to do atonement work. We want to pray for those atrocities that have happened there, and we stupid people say, don't have it there, instead of saying, let us also have one, alongside with people who are going to do repentance in depth for things and for a planet that's plagued with so much. Can you imagine what it would be like to there pray for finding a cure for AIDS? Okay? So, I, I just want, want to say we are sitting on this volcano and when somebody goes into depth of meditation, all these kinds of things start coming up and we often at that point shut down our descent into our own inner depth because we don't dare to tarry there for a while and to experience what we might encounter. Okay. We really need a deep, deep healing. And if I, uh, someone wanted to know what I have to say about Israel and about Judaism, I see bruised people in Israel trying to make sense of how do we hold on to the land when you need people with a great deal of mental and spiritual health to be able to deal with so difficult a situation as two cousins wanting the same land. It's not something that will have a political solution alone. It needs a solution on a much greater and deeper, more profound level than that. So I just wanted to respond to, to this issue from, from, from this place. Please. In a certain sense, it becomes so clear from exactly the things Reb Zalman has just been talking about that we as peoples are not separate from one another but are coexisting and cooperating and as different organs in a body are we as different modes of being on the earth. And when one begins to fail, others shore it up until it's healthy again. All of the Eastern teachings that were miraculously and through grace available to people of a particular generation were not so easily available. Remember Alexandra David Neal's books of, of how she had to trek through Tibet uh, under great hardship to find some of these things? And how you really had to search and ferret out through the, the what was it, the British Association for Parapsychology, a British Association of Psychical Research on the one hand, and the Theosoph Theosophists on the other. You know, little dusty corners here and there, what now are spread not only in the esoteric bookstores, but all over. And these were made available, these other means, Zen, Yoga, Vipassana, precisely when the need for spiritual experience was so very great, and the hunger was so very great on the part of a people whose business that is, but who could not attend to it in a certain way for a generation. And in the same way, far from resenting that Carmelites are there at Auschwitz, part of me is saying, bless them, in their compassion, they're doing our work for us until we can do it ourselves. How to embrace the new without jettisoning the old in criteria of making tools, new tools for Judaism. Okay. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. There is a mezuzah. Who is to write that? The Torah addresses each and every one of us. Now it's become so 
that we have priced ourselves out of the market with how a mezuzah has to be written, that unless you buy one that somebody else has written on parchment for you and put on the door, you can't quite have a mezuzah. Now let us say for a moment that you have a programmable chip that is set in to your mezuzah cover. And you programmed it to say, stay in mindfulness. And as you come in the door, you touch the mezuzah, and it begins, stay in mindfulness. Okay. That would be amplifying. See, I'm not saying get rid of the mezuzah. I'm saying put on the cover of mezuzah a chip, a computer chip, that will enhance the point that the mezuzah is trying to make. Stay in mindfulness, stay in awareness, or each time you touch the mezuzah, you would hear the Shema sounding this way. Now, notice, I don't mean this as a joke. I mean this that when you begin to ask yourself, what is it that I need in order to stay in, in, in my awareness, in my attunement <coughs> to God? Tfilin and a talit are very important to this very day. And what should a vegetarian, a vegan, do if he would like to wear tefillin, but that same commitment that makes him assume eating meat also makes him feel awry about wearing the tefillin? Okay. What option does such a person have? I would like to open for such a person an option in which they would be able to make their equivalent as they're being prompted. It is not the, the, the inclination for evil that says to such a person, don't wear tefillin. Get that? It is his inclination for good. How could we help such a person? I want to say this, this touches even more. This touches the whole thing about the distaff. Women, for many, many years, there was no place for a single Jewish woman between the time she was in her father's house to the time when she was in her husband's house. When you begin to read at the end of the book of Numbers, the description of vows, it says there, Bin ureha beit abiha. And then it says it has a right away in the house of her husband. What about all the years that a single Jewish woman is on her own? Does she not have a right to represent herself? And what about the insight? Chochmat nashim banta bayit. It is a wisdom of women that built the house. Our house has gone rickety without having the wisdom of women to hold it up. I have found me for many years I taught in the same manner in which I was taught. A lead man sits up there and teaches people. It is really very important to share this teaching with a woman. And I'd like to hear from you what you have found out about these things. Which things? About me teaching. Whatever. Well, I have to give you a tiny bit of background, and that is that I was raised almost entirely by my mother, who is a fearless sort, who raised me to believe that I could do anything I wanted, and so I always took that for granted. <laughs> and I didn't know any different, which means that I went into places I didn't know were forbidden and never found out until way after it was too late. <laughs> She's also a teacher, and so it feels natural to teach what I know. But when I began listening very deeply, to some of the things Rubzalman was saying, <coughs> things began to look a little different. You know, I also, I didn't, I had the good fortune not to have the load of anger that many women have to have who were thoroughly suppressed during certain periods of their lives. Because by chance, and not by my own um, intention, I simply wasn't. But I grew parallel to them and heard their anger. 
And when I began to hear, especially when you began really describing what the normal way of life for a yeshiva boy, for instance, in his teens, in his 20s, as a young man would be, and I was hearing this parallel to hearing how many mitzvot women were exempt from because they were time-bound and other things were considered more important. And I began to think, oh, were we were lucky. Because in a certain sense, there was the possibility for maintaining a connection with organic time in a way that people otherwise may not be able to be. And what I'm seeing now is not that we were underprivileged by being unable to study in a certain way, although that is also true for people who wanted to study and were denied access, but that our men were also underprivileged in being unable to honor the rhythms of their own bodies and of their own families as much, perhaps, as they would have liked to. And what I see is the undervaluing of the feminine in both men and women. So that what happens now, at I can only speak of the United States because I haven't really been here for very long, Wednesday. <laughs> but I know that what happens in the United States very often in the ordaining of women as rabbis now or in other public situations where a woman is, uh, is teaching in a Jewish context is that she suddenly feels that she has to do it just like the men do, which is a great pity because then we are again denying the feminine in the women and in the men. And it's these other, it's not other information, it's simply other modes of perception. And by the way, I would like to say that I don't think that there really are absolute distinctions in our gender-related adjectives, our gender-related qualities. I think they're so in our culture, but the only thing we know for sure is that every culture does have gender-related attributes but they're not the same ones in every culture. Isn't that marvelous? You know, um, the nurturer is not necessarily and always mostly the female in every culture. It happens to be so in the ones we know best. So when I look at what has been suppressed in all of us, it's very hard to put language to because it's the inarticulate and incohate that's been suppressed. We don't have the talent for putting expression to that sort of perception. We have developed talent for putting expression to certain ways of thinking. And the closest we really get is Midrash and Agada, where remarkable flights of fancy and remarkable flights of association are taken. When you really look at them, they're wild. They're wild and wonderful. And they're forced to take the expression as if they were rational, because rational is what is respected. However, I would wager that very many people in this room have on occasion taken a decision not on the basis of what was rational, but on the basis of an inarticulate tickle somewhere in the region of the belly that was very hard to explain so you didn't bother. <laughs> Somebody knows that one. And it's the voicing of these expressions and these perceptions that I find coming out now and comes out very much in our teaching together where between the two of us, we cover a great deal of perceptive ground because we often have different modes. And by the way, they're not constant. We sometimes shift modes. That is, when, I know, when I'm out of one particular mode, that gap is then filled by your doing it, and vice versa. This brings me to some of the other questions. I think if any of us, women and men alike, sink into the part of us that is very deeply and rootedly physical, that we may have or, or have had experience, and I don't mean in the head, I mean the real experience in your gut, in your bones, that you are not separate from everything else. Neither other people, nor other species, nor other kind, everything that we put up as classifications, as boundaries, as distinctions, from the biological ones to the national borders, which I never could take seriously for some reason. But that's because I live in America, and there's such a long time before you hit a national border. Um, to, the, to the barriers of different religions, ways of thinking, gender, and so on, 
the Native Americans have a wonderful expression, which they use quite often, all my relations, in which they mean all of the people, all of the animals, all of the plants, all of the stones, the earth under my feet, the sky over my head. And when one honors one's biological experience, there comes certainly peak moments when you experience this as a truth and a reality. Now, if this is the case, then certain realizations follow. One of them is that life comes from death. This is not only physical. I mean, I had the most remarkable experience recently of some neighborhood children saying, lady, did you know that in your garage is a dead dog? I didn't. And I went, and expecting to find something dead, I found this roiling of life. That is, it had been dead for long enough for it to be crawling with maggots. And at the moment, this wasn't disgusting. This was a wonder because from that death was immediately springing a life. I think that the part of us that we need to sink into, all of us, is the part that is physical enough to go beyond the initial reaction of disgust and shuddering at this to the acceptance of this as a truth in this particular world. That's one. The next is that none of us is separate. What happens on the other side of the world affects us here. The fact that many Americans demand McDonald's hamburgers and therefore they cut down acres and acres of rainforest in Brazil to pasture the cattle for a short period of time who will become those hamburgers affects the temperature of the entire world. Now, it's easy to say these things now because they're couched in the language of science which can measure and say these things. But many generations ago, there were people who had only their own perceptions to go by and went into their bodies and into their souls and could have told you that anyway, that what happens when, you, when a tree is chopped down on the other side of the world, it does have a repercussion right over here and in us. And knowing that, the necessity of learning compassion absolutely can be no longer ignored. Now, this is a part of our patriarchal religion. So I'm not in any way advocating that we jettison what's brought us so far, but only that we allow for the reintegration of the modes that have had to be denied in order to learn something different for a long time. Surely we've all gone through, at some point or another, an experience of having or wishing to learn something new whether it was a new body of information or a new way of working. And discovering that the only way you're going to learn that new way is by ceasing to do what worked for you before. Because if you, if you can have recourse to that and fall back on it, you'll never learn how far you can get with the new one. Has anybody had that experience? You know, I remember the great pain of abandoning a way that I'd developed of working so that I felt an expertise and a confidence in order to learn a new way in which I felt klutzy for nine months on end. But had I not denied myself access to the old way, I never would have learned the new. And after a sufficient time, I began being able to reintegrate. And so a denial of a certain way of consciousness that kept people perhaps excessively tied to the earth, excessively tied to cycles, when clearly there had been a perception of something quite beyond that, may have given rise to all that we've done for the past 2,000 years that's been so valuable in the developmental process of ourselves as a people and of the whole human race, the development of our brains, of the way we use ourselves. And perhaps now it's reached that climax where it's possible then to reintegrate in a new and developed form that which we had to reject for so long before. So what I see as the place of women in the emerging Judaism is a reintegration of the female, both in women and in men, as acceptable, these modes of perception which are less precise and less rational, they can be dared perhaps for a while, yes, to see where they go, to see what they lead to. Um, 
and to see how they can enrich the whole of what's been there before. And now you see something that Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev was teaching when he said, up to now, we have been reading only what the black letters of the Torah are stating. And now we are beginning to learn also what the white letters of the Torah are saying, because every letter has to be surrounded by white. So, and the Torah was given white, black fire on white fire, and you see the complementarity with which we can think together. God says, come let us reason together. This reasoning together that is now opening up is so marvelous. Now let me look at some of the other things. Judaism and shamanism, yes, that was a, <clears throat> a connection. <coughs> Pesach night. We are sitting at the Seder. It is in that one night there is concentrated through the bitter herbs and the haroset and the matzah and, and the way in which the Seder plate is laid out, that great mandala of all the parts that are in the Seder plate and the three matzahs underneath. A concentration of deuterosis, that's a Greek word of teaching, that unfolds for the rest of a person's life. Year after year at Pineor we have that experience that before Pesach, Jews are crawling out from the woodwork who you would not know are Jews are committed or are engaged in Judaism, but before Passover they let here, could we have a Seder? It is as if the salmon are swimming upstream again somehow. And why was that? Because of that very physicality in which we had. <coughs> Would you then not say that every Pesach night we are involved in something that is shamanic? Who is the person whom we invite to the Seder table? Prophet Elijah. Most of the time when people used to speak about the prophets, they used to say, speak of Isaiah, priest and prophet. They spoke about the literary prophets. They did not speak so much about the shamanic prophets like Elijah and Elisha. Do you remember the stories concerning them? First of all, there were some people who joined them, bands of roving B'nai Hanavim, the sons of the prophets. I'm not the fair of the girls in the battle, so I'll travel in the same as I'm going to go. Whenever I hear a siren, I just pray for whatever it is, whether this police ambulance or whatever that was that went by here. Is that a sound of an emergency vehicle that I just heard? Yes. You hear that sound that some of the merit of our being together might save that life that they're involved in saving. So, <clears throat> Prophet Elijah is the one who manages to be for us the model of how one hears the voice of God in silence. Remember how he came to the Mount Horeb? <clears throat> there he was at Mount Sinai. <clears throat> and there was a fire, and there was an earthquake, and there was a storm, and God was not in the fire, was not in the earthquake, was not in the storm. Where was God? Called the Mamadaka in the, in, the, in, the, in the sound of subtle stillness. Okay. And when you begin to see that kind of power that is able to take a widow's last bit of oil and last bit of flour and to stretch it, there you see that all the loaves and fishes had many mighty precedents <laughs> among those shamanic prophets that we had in Judaism. Uh, if Saul wanted to find the lost donkeys, he went to Samuel the prophet. Talking about prophets and Samuel, uh, I want to mention the issue of mediumship somebody raised uh, that. Do you remember that wonderful story about what's called commonly the Witch of Endor. 
Okay. Here uh, was this woman who, when Saul needed to talk to Samuel, the prophet, and Samuel was dead at that time, was able to bring him up, raise him up from the dead, so that he would then hear. It was a doomsday message that he heard. Tomorrow you and your son will have joined me in the netherworld. And so we have had a long history of where we felt that when somebody says nobody ever came back from there, that wasn't the experience of our folk <coughs> understanding of things. How many of you have had stories told in your own family where people said, when so-and-so was born, Baba so-and-so came in a cholim, in a dream, and she said, name the child after me, and such and such a thing would come. Or someone would have to go and stand for the preziv, preziv. How would I translate it? To be drafted in the Russian army. And a dream, a warning would come from someone who already was on the other side. And what is it? Why did people go to visit graves and to there pray? if it wasn't for the intercession of the people who had gone before. We used to call it in Yiddish, Kvorim Reisen, you know? When somebody was in a, in a situation where a name had to be changed when someone was, was sick and you went to the graves, and you have it in the book of Kinot, which we recently read, how Jeremiah went to the graves of the patriarchs and there roused them to, to appear before God and to pray. So what I'm trying to say is we didn't feel that there was a total loss. In fact, we used to say that the Sadducees were the ones who denied life after death. The Pharisees were the ones who affirmed life after death. And this was part and parcel of our, of our belief and our heritage. The Zohar finally says, if it were not for the prayers of those who have gone beyond this world couldn't exist. How much of who we are today is because ancestors, how did we used to say it in Yiddish? May she be a good intercessor for you. And our understanding was that we were still in some way connected, that the connection did not cease. I just want to say it's really important for people to inform themselves about Jewish beliefs about life after death because we don't think that this is the end. It, we may be nine months in the womb and 90 months in a body, but just as we are born out of the womb after the nine months, so we are born out of the body after the 90 months to another form of life that is beyond. So, I, please. I'd like to tackle this from another angle, and that has to do with the use of mediums and spirits. Because, as you all know, um, Samuel preceded his doomsday message by saying, why did you come and bother me? I think there is merit in being able to well mourn somebody who has gone and allow them to go on and change their form. I'm saying this because I don't know if here in England the channeling craze has hit. Has it? Yeah. Well, it's hit in the United States in a big way. And there's some very interesting things going on. One is that I do not want to deny the value of some of the information that comes. And it's quite possible that some people are actually doing what they say they're doing. But a great many people, I believe, are doing what Jean Houston calls pouring over their own treasures. And I'd like to speak for a moment about this because what this says is not a dire message that channelers, alas, are not really channeling. Because first of all, ah, sorry about that. Um, the phenomenon we're seeing right now is that people are saying, I go into a state of trance in which I either speak or write automatically. It's not me. I'm channeling an entity from somewhere in some such a time who wants to communicate this message here now. I am only the channel through which this information comes. Now, this is an interesting phenomenon to take this particular form because it's really simply an expansion of the medium phenomenon that existed at the beginning of the century, the end of the last century. 
But one of the things we're finding is that we are all very porous beings. And I often feel like information and ideas are floating around the earth simply waiting for the mouth to open up and express them in the right spot at the right time. Um, and they sometimes come in clumps, and they sometimes come at the same time. We discovered that some of the work that we've been doing in the Wisdom School has resulted in a clear line of various issues coming up that must be addressed and must be evolved to another stage. And after the whole business is over, I read something from the other side of the country or the other side of the world, and I find that that same thing has been arising. So it is the zeitgeist, finding mouths all over the place. But about channeling, I do have to say that who is to say that just because somebody doesn't have a body, they're any wiser? <laughs> and along with that, I must say that while we are here, it is a wonderful thing to explore our own treasures and what may lie in other parts of our being. And to do this in a safe and grounded way and to take great daring in doing this. So that the, the kind of disowning state that happens when someone says they're channeling can, in some instances, allow them to go inside themselves to a place they otherwise wouldn't because the ego that either has pride or fear isn't in the way doing that just then. They've put it aside by the fiction of channeling. And of course, it's quite possible that sometimes they really are channeling. I really don't know. I don't see in that particular way, although I have some people who do. But I want to leave you with my favorite word on channeling of spirits or mediums, and that is a cartoon of Gary Larson, which shows a prehistoric man in a loincloth jumping up and down on a rock, making an, a, an incredible face, and surrounded by a crowd of people. And the caption says, and just as he had predicted, Targ began channeling a three million year old gibbon named Gus. <laughs> I'd like us to make a switch from here because there comes a question now about how does all this tie in with individual and personal prayer to God? And I'd like to make a switch from this mode in which we were talking up to now to another mode. In order to make this work for us, I'm offering you a challenge. I'd like you to stand up. You've been sitting a little too long and you need a bit of a stretch. What is a seraph? Do you know what a seraph is? An angel. How, is the, how are the seraphim described? Six wings. With twain they cover their face, with twain they cover their leg, and with twain they fly. What is a menorah? A menorah is a seraph raising all six wings. Okay. I'd like you now to be seraphim in this, the following way. A center that's the heart, kadosh, God as we know holiness without too much conceptual, but we feel it, kadosh. Then there is kadosh as we know in the brain, we understand, sacred, holy. And then there is kadosh beyond what we understand. And that is a, a way of saying, if holy were only what I know with my mind, it wouldn't be holy enough, right? So, holy, 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 Yah of hosts. The whole world is filled with God's glory. Can you do that with me? A few times it'll give you a stretch too. <laughs> kadosh, 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 yad Hebrew or English. 